Hello, History 365. Today we're going to be discussing the Viking Age, a period from roughly the late 8th century AD into the early 11th century AD. Um, now, the term Viking, at least in the Scandinavian languages, um, roughly means pirate or freebooter. Um, and while certainly many Scandinavians do indeed engage in uh, piracy or freebooting or raiding, um, not all Scandinavians consider themselves Vikings. Um, so the, the Viking Age is a, is a sort of colorful term that may not necessarily be an accurate term. Um, now, the key uh, demographic aspect of this era is, however, a huge Scandinavian diaspora in which various Scandinavian peoples um, uh, go very far abroad um, into Normandy, into northern England, into Dublin, into uh, central Europe, around Russia and Ukraine, um, as far as uh, uh, the Byzantine Empire, as mercenaries, and then as colonizers far, far into the uh, unknown waters of the Atlantic, um, colonizing Iceland and Greenland, and even very briefly, um, North America. Um, so uh, the raiding, the, the actual sort of Vikings, um, who are pirates and raiders, are actually part of a much broader Scandinavian diaspora um, that defines this period. Um, now, why is there a huge Scandinavian diaspora? Um, I would think about it in two ways. The first would be uh, the push, and the second would be the pull. So what are the push factors? Um, probably the biggest push factors involve state formation in Scandinavia itself, in that um, uh, a situation where you have relatively a, a large number of either chieftains or petty kings um, starts to consolidate into um, you know, chieftains turn into petty kings, and a few of the petty kings actually become the kings of the medieval kingdoms of Denmark and Norway and Sweden. Um, we're not going to go in depth into that process, but suffice it to say, you actually see consolidation into more powerful ruling figures and eventually into states. And state formation, while it has some obvious winners, those people who ultimately become um, the medieval kings of the various Scandinavian kingdoms, it has its obvious losers. If you were a petty chieftain who was happy in a world where there were simply a bunch of petty chieftains, you might resent when one of these petty chieftains starts to rule as a petty king. Likewise, if there's a bunch of petty kings, you might start to, to resent if one of those kings starts to exert authority and hegemony over everyone else. Um, so because there are losers in the state formation process, one way that the losers uh, adapt is through migration, out-migration. Um, they join the diaspora looking for opportunities abroad. And those opportunities uh, could be found in a variety of ways, um, if, all, all the way from settling North America, serving as a Byzantine uh, mercenary, or um, raiding monasteries um, along the coast of Ireland. Um, now, in terms of the pull factors, um, one pull factor must be actually the renewed economic prosperity that we see in Europe during the Carolingian era. And in the last lecture, I even noted that we have evidence for this prosperity from the huge sudden spike in silver smelting um, that we can detect in the Greenland ice. Um, so uh, uh, Europe is prosperous. This applies not just to the Carolingian Empire proper, um, but this is a moment when uh, in, uh, there's a huge flourishing uh, of monasteries across a whole kind of Celtic um, Christianity that runs from Ireland and Scotland and into Northumbria. Um, and, uh, 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 and also the, the, the prosperity of the Anglo-Saxon kingdom, uh, which is gelling in uh, England uh, at this time. Uh, uh, all of this prosperity is great, but it makes it a tempting target. Um, and so this is probably one of the pull factors. Why are people going out and raiding? Well, um, there's actually a lot of stuff to, to raid. Um, the economy of Europe is as good as it's been since Roman times, um, and that's going to attract um, parasites, namely parasites who uh, ride around in big long boats and infiltrate up your river system. Now, another pull factor, which I've also already briefly alluded to, is the, Byzantines, the Byzantine Empire's desperate need for mercenaries. Um, the Byzantine Empire uh, 
really in the in the seventh and eighth centuries is still largely staffing its armies with Roman troops, people that have been recruited um, uh, either from the Balkans or Anatolia from the internal territories of the Byzantine Empire. Um, but increasingly, um, the Byzantines come to rely on foreign troops um, uh, as, as a way of staffing their armies. And we do know that a significant or at least important source of foreign troops are the people of the Scandinavian diaspora, people who have grown up in uh, a society where there is a great deal of kind of low-level warfare, who may have cut their teeth as raiders, um, and are more than happy to accept um, the pay from the Byzantine emperor. Uh, and indeed, uh, there are several uh, 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 graffitos, carved inscriptions in the great church in Constantinople, the Hagia Sophia, um, that actually show uh, runes, uh, the uh, form of writing used by Scandinavian peoples. It's not technically alphabetic, um, but we have, we have the runes probably of a uh, Scandinavian mercenary um, carved into the Hagia Sophia, um, actually a sign of the, some of the extent of this diaspora. Um, so mercenary service is going to pull people out of Scandinavia. Um, also, uh, and this, this is, uh, we talked about this when we talked about Carolingian warfare, um, the uh, high demand that exists from the Abbasid Caliphate for slaves, um, uh, uh, which continues to drive a lot of warfare um, in Europe, uh, this is a market that the Vikings are well suited to fulfill. Um, and so uh, the fact that there's a demand for slaves, you have people who are actually capable of raiding, um, and uh, therefore one aspect of kind of the Viking economy is going to be raiding for, for slaves, trying to just capture and kidnap people, um, then trafficking them through the, through the river system of Europe, especially down through what will become Russia, which is why the Rus is initially a a Scandinavian trading outpost, um, and then uh, down through the Black Sea where they can be sold um, to the Abbasids, who again form, because of the, the power and prosperity, form the great market for slaves um, in Western Eurasia. So we have push factors and pull factors, um, and this uh, nonetheless uh, does indeed um, uh, uh, drive this massive diaspora. Um, now, Eventually, many Scandinavians go beyond just raiding, trading, mercenary service, and also engage in settlement and colonization. Um, in some instances, as with uh, Rollo, um, a, a Scandinavian lord who is uh, offered a, a feudal position as the Duke of Normandy, um, this involves integrating into sort of the European system. Uh, in some instances, settlement involves uh, conquest, whether it's the uh, conquest of parts of northern England that become the Dane law, um, uh, or parts of, of, uh, of Ireland uh, around Dublin that also become a essentially a, a Viking settlement. Um, uh, in other areas, uh, uh, it involves taking over territory such as Iceland or Greenland that is relatively uninhabited. Now, there are... Um, uh, Inuit in Greenland, who actually come into military conflict. And there are also Inuit in, uh, not Inuit, there are also natives and uh, native peoples in the New World for, who encounter, uh, in, it seems, in a hostile way, um, the settlement that is briefly established um, in North America, and what the sagas refer to as Vinland, um, after the probably Concord style grapes that are found growing there. Um, so, uh, uh, again, raiding and trading after a while ultimately also gives way to settlement and colonization. Um, now, the Vikings prove pretty successful as, uh, as raiders, um, and the question is why? Do they have any kind of military advantages? Um, in some ways, uh, I, I would say that the, the analysis is probably pretty similar to the analysis that I suggested for the Islamic um, forces that overrun the Byzantine and Sassanid empires in that while Vikings are pretty tough warriors, man for man, a Viking warrior probably isn't all that much different from a, a, a Carolingian uh, a soldier or an Anglo-Saxon uh, soldier in terms of weapons and armor. Um, indeed, everything we know about uh, Viking armor suggests that it's pretty much quite similar to 
uh, forms of, of arms and armor being used elsewhere. Um, so, for example, the Viking sword um, is essentially a pretty standard uh, uh, Northern European uh, uh, blade. Um, it's actually directly descended from the late Roman Spatha and very similar to the kinds of swords that are being used by the Merovingians, the Carolingians, um, the Anglo-Saxons. Um, and the same goes for spears, the, the round shields, uh, uh, the various types of body armor, including chain mail. Um, there's, no, there's, no, there's nothing to suggest that Vikings are doing anything other than using a, a pretty standard um, panoply um, that at this point is widely dispersed across Western Europe. So what does give them an edge? Why is it so hard for, say, Carolingian forces, late Carolingian forces, to stop these Viking raids? Um, and I think it's, it actually is probably the same basic aspect that gives uh, the Islamic armies of uh, the conquest period an edge, mobility. Um, they can move very fast. Now, for the Islamic armies, the mobility comes basically because they've got camels that they can ride through the desert and, and emerge. Um, for the Vikings, it's going to be their ships. Um, uh, the fact that they are they have these uh, light, lightly built ships, they're built in a different style from the way most European ships are built. Most European ships are caravel ships, which means the planks actually fit together one on top of the other um, and are, are then uh, you know, caulked together to be waterproof. Clicker ships, uh, clicker uh, built ships, um, are actually built with the planks overlapping, um, and uh, you can actually you can actually see that on the hull in the picture. Um, this has some disadvantages. You there, you can only make a clinker built ship so big, whereas you can make a caravel built ship uh, uh, really kind of as big as you like. Um, but clinker built ships are light. They're fast. Um, they are. Uh, they actually can endure a lot of, uh, of navigational tensions, which means they can be. They can uh, a light a ship can can go both on the sea and is uh, it's, it's tough enough to go on the sea, but it's also then shallow enough that it can go up rivers. Um, and this is a big advantage if you're a raider, right? That you can actually set out on an oceanic voyage, go up the river. Your 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 shallow draft then allows you to go very far up the river, and that means you don't have to disembark at a port. And, and somehow re-embark in a different boat or march overland. You simply shoot up the river. Um, you can, if there's a place you'd like to raid, you can get out, you can raid, and then you can get in your boat and zip away. Um, and so these, uh, these Viking boats, these, again, these, these clinker-built ships, um, are going to be a technological advantage that gives Viking raiders a tremendous amount of mobility um, that, uh, in many instances, catches their uh, opponents and victims off guard. Um, uh, even though, again, man for man, um, the Vikings are are really have, have not a, don't really have a particular advantage over uh, any of the uh, opposing forces that they face, and it's important to note sometimes they lose and lose badly. Um, for example, uh, we've recently discovered a, um, a grisly collection of bodies. It seems fifty one uh, men of military age. Um, and their bodies were buried separately from their heads. Uh, this was found in England near Wycliffe. Um, and uh, uh, because of the, uh, the iridium tracing, they determined that these men grew up in Scandinavia. So here you actually have in England a Viking raiding party that clearly is uh, presumably overwhelmed and it seems captured, executed in mass, and then uh, deliberately buried in this abnormal way with the heads separated from the body. So, the Vikings don't always win. Um, and indeed, um, there will be uh, certainly uh, one thing that kings will do is celebrate the various times that they defeat Viking uh, raiders or even Viking invaders. Or Scan I guess we really should say Scan Viking raiders and Scandinavian invaders might be the, the best way to phrase things. Um, uh, whether it's uh, the Irish high king Brian Boru uh, defeating uh, a number of uh, a Viking army outside of Dublin, um, or Alfred the Great, um, defeating uh, the great heathen army or the great Viking army, um, supposedly in 876 AD. Um, so uh, uh, in, in, again, in some ways, these uh, 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 Viking uh, raiders, uh, you know, do have a serious impact on some aspects of the economy. The first Viking raid is generally held to be a raid at the um, uh, Northumbrian monastery at Lindisfarne in uh, 793 
AD. Um, and these monasteries, again, are very wealthy. Um, many of them are located on the coast. Many of them have been uh, you know, given large amounts of, of treasures as essentially donations. Um, and so therefore are obviously very tempting targets if you are indeed a Viking raider. <coughs> Um, now, again, the Viking Age, uh, you might say what ends the Viking Age, um, uh, certainly Scandinavia, the various Scandinavian kingdoms, are going to be important players um, in grand international politics of medieval Europe, um, really in some ways up until the Black Death. Um, uh, and one sort of demographic aspect of the Black Death, which, which initially strikes in 1348, um, is that it uh, strikes everywhere, strikes Scandinavia as hard as anywhere else. But Scandinavia, for whatever reason, is slower to recover demographically. Um, so while in, say, 1348, uh, the kingdom of, of uh, Norway is probably as populous and powerful as the kingdom of England, um, uh, by 1600, England has recovered and Norway has fallen behind in terms of population. Um, uh, that said, the, the Viking Age generally held to end you know, probably in, in the early 11th century AD, uh, in part because the state formation process in Scandinavia is basically complete. Um, so the, that aspect of the, the, the diaspora is basically gone. Um, and also in many places where Scandinavian peoples have, uh, have settled, um, they no longer were fierce raiders or recent invaders. They're simply part of the landscape, um, whether that is the uh, kingdom of the Kivian Rus, where, um, again, Viking traders and merchants um, simply set up shop and become just another state in the system, um, whether it's the Dukes of Normandy, who go from being simultaneously vassals to the King of France, to, as we'll see next time in, in 1066, they become the Kings of England, um, uh, uh, they, they simply become part of the landscape rather than a novel and quite frightening intrusion. So what we'll talk about next time will be um, uh, uh, the Norman invasions, the Battle of Hastings, the Bayeux Tapestry, um, which actually represents a remarkable piece of evidence for what medieval warfare looks like as we move into um, the second millennia um, AD. Um, so we will talk next week. Good day.